Tonight on Beyond the District, we see how one dog is helping others. And we also see how scooters are becoming a nuisance in one city. Beyond the District will return in two minutes. Crowded hallways are the loneliest places For outcasts and rebels Or anyone who just dares to be different And you've been trying for so long to find out where your place is But in their narrow minds There's no room for anyone Who dares to do something different Oh, but listen for a minute Trust the one Who's been where you are Wishing all it was was still and stones those words cut deep but they don't mean you're all alone and you're not invisible Hello, I'm Lauren Pecker, and welcome to TV21's Beyond the District. And I'm Kira Bruno. Later on tonight, we will take a look how some special dogs are helping people that are in a rough spot. But first tonight, storms can be a scary thing, but imagine a thunderstorm hits too close to home. Here's a look. It was an encounter too close for comfort. The anxious I've ever been, most scared I've ever been, like all the emotions at once, you know. Around 3 o'clock this afternoon, Eric Clement was watching the weather in Westerly when he became a subject of it. The wind starts picking up. The door starts to swing as I'm filming it. I grab it like this, and I'm bringing it in, but I'm still filming it. And then that's when it struck. Take a look at the encounter he caught on camera. It shows torrential rain and winds rolling through the pond. Next comes lightning. Oh! Oh! Clement says he was holding on to the doorknob when it struck. Feeling as though he'd been electrocuted with no feeling in his arm, he dialed the Westerly Police Department. It was almost like this, I couldn't move. Fire officials came to check out the building as Eric was checked out by paramedics. They said it was probably the lightning strike coming, you know, through the ground into the door and zapped me like that. Clement is expected to be okay. He says he saw his life flash before his eyes literally and is grateful to be alive. Like God gave me a gift, you know. I could not be standing here right now. Up next, one teacher has gotten herself in hot water for saying no to the zero, and the policy has the district up in arms. Years of teaching, I have so much stuff. Motivation, inspiration. That's what Diane Torado strives to provide her students as a longtime teacher. Teaching is a calling for me. So she thought the same when she started teaching eighth grade history at Westgate in Port St. Lucie last month. I had so much fun decorating my room. But then she assigned this Explore Notebook project. This is what I gave weeks for. When several students didn't turn it in, Toronto found out about what she says is the school's no zero policy, reflected here in the student and parent handbook. But what if they don't turn anything in? We give them a 50, I go. Oh, no, we don't. We spoke to a parent at the school about what he thinks. You don't know what's going on at home, and is what you see is front level. Because if my son blatantly chooses not to do it, he knows he's got an issue. Ain't that right? Toronto was terminated on September 14th, but there's no cause mentioned in the letter from the principal since she was still in her probationary period. On her last day, she wrote this message to her students on her whiteboard before she left and sent out a picture of it through a class app. Her students responded. You are right about not giving people 50s. And then she posted it on Facebook. It's now been shared more than 400 times. A grade in the Stratus class is earned. Toronto hopes this time she motivates policy change. I'm so upset. We have a nation of kids that are expecting to get paid and live a life just for showing up. And it's not real. Now hundreds of animals are left in shelters every month. We stopped in to see some special dogs that are looking for a forever home. 
these puppies were transported to the Fox Valley Humane Association from Alabama because of extreme overcrowding in shelters down south. Well, Alabama and a lot of the southern states, they just do not have population control. The spay and neuter is not um, as easy for the folks there, nor do they understand the importance of it as much, but they are trying to educate. The FVHA is already considered full. Getting the puppies into a home quickly is crucial, so the shelter can continue to take in more animals. <laughs> At least 30 puppies and some kittens will be available for adoption Saturday and Sunday at PetSmart in Appleton. It's same day adoption, so it's really nice to be able to see these dogs not have to sit in a shelter. They can go directly into a home and, you know, start their forever family. This weekend, the shelter is also looking for donations of dry dog and cat food. If you do bring in a bag of food, then you can receive up to a 20% discount on the adoption fee. <laughs> Adoption fees cover spay and neuter, up-to-date shots, and a health checkup. There is quite a variety of breeds, and it's a, there's a lot of labs, there's a lot of, you know, wiry-looking puppies, there's just fuzzy dogs, you know, we don't know what they exactly are, but they are a ball of fun, just, just waiting, you know, to join your family. Next, Indianapolis Police says scooter riders who breaks the rules can now get more than just a warning. But the questions are how much will the ticket be for and what is not allowed. Wish TV's Tim McNichols reports. A rainy day is enough to keep most scooters parked. Bad news for the riders, but not for Regina Dillard. What do you think of the scooter? The scooters are very annoying. She works downtown and she says she wouldn't mind the scooters if riders stayed in the street. You seldom see one alone. And it's, you know, you have to get out the way because there's so many of them. IMPD released a PSA this week informing people how to ride the scooters. The way you should ride it and the way you shouldn't ride it. Police say they can also ticket riders for disobeying traffic laws. The ticket can jump up to $40 if you don't pay within seven days. Each officer has the discretion to write these tickets, right? The officer uh, interacting with the individual decides whether or not he wants to issue that, that, that citation. IMPD says their tickets are for moving violations, not parking. If officers catch you vandalizing a scooter, you could face a misdemeanor charge. A man who lives downtown sent us this picture from south in Pennsylvania. Police tweeted a picture this week of a scooter in the canal. An IMPD says it's against the ordinance to even ride scooters along the canal. That also goes for greenways and both lanes of the cultural trail. If it were me riding on a scooter in traffic, I would make sure that I had a helmet on. Uh, because these things travel pretty quickly. Police say you should park the scooters on the sidewalk, leaving at least four feet of space for people to walk by. Now we are going to take a short break, but coming up we take a look at how one woman is battling back from a shark bite. And we also take a look at some gymnasts that are coming together to help one of their own. song for the broken hearted Welcome back. A shark bite victim is telling her story in Florida. She's calm and recovering, but Ian Margul reports a shark took such a huge bite from her hand, it left behind a tooth. I think anyone who dives or spearfishes knows there's an inherent risk. Just 48 hours after she was bitten by a shark, 
Maggie Ewing is speaking about the horrifying experience. I know sharks aren't really going for me. He was totally going for the fish. It was my mistake, but nonetheless, he got me. Maggie and her boyfriend, Jaron Dorfman, were spearfishing in the Bahamas on Sunday in a spot they had been to dozens of times before. Both of them are experienced divers, so when Maggie speared a hogfish, she knew to look around for nearby predators that might be looking to snag her catch. I uh, actually turned around to see if any sharks were coming before going up, and um, I felt the pain instantly and turned around, and a shark had come over this shoulder and just sort of latched onto my hand. Eventually, the black tip shark let go, and she ascended to the boat, bleeding and in a lot of pain. And I thought she was going to bleed out. She was turning pale, and I was losing it. She was rushed to land, where she was met by rescue crews, and soon after was airlifted to Fort Lauderdale and then brought to Memorial Regional for surgery. The index, long ring, and small fingers were all involved and had the traumatic uh, lacerations. In fact, in this x-ray, you can see a shark tooth still lodged in her finger. Fortunately, doctors were able to save her hand and fingers, and Maggie says this won't scare her from going back to the Bahamas. It's one of my favorite things to do. If I mean, it happened. I'll deal with it, and I'll get back in the water. Up next, gymnasts from a school district in Kansas are used to competing against each other on the mat, but off the mat, they're on the same team. Team Anna, f fellow gymnast, now paralyzed after a traumatic accident. As Megan Dillard found out, they're coming together for Anna in the most incredible way. Anna got hurt in a gym just like this, and even though she's not wearing a leotard these days, make no mistake, she's a gymnast through and through. Anna is the most inspirational person I've ever met in my entire life. Olathe gymnastics coach Mallory West has learned more from senior Anna's role than she could ever teach. You never, ever, ever hear her complain, ever talk about her having a rough time. It's always, how can I look for the joy in the situation? Anna was a freshman when she fell off the high beams at practice four years ago. She right now does not have any feeling in her legs. From the belly button down, she's paralyzed. She's actually more motivated. She actually told me that this accident made her humble made her feel like, you know, like you need to enjoy each day. And these days, she's watching, coaching other girls, writing routines. She could resent the sport, and instead, it's made her find even more passion. It's hard, but not being here would be worse. I would just hate for the sport that's been a part of my life for many multiple years, my entire life, basically, and to just be cut away from that. That would be more of a dramatic change than my injury itself. It's why not only her teammates, but her competitors across the district work together to help get her an exoskeleton. But this machine, she can put it on and essentially walk. So it would be something like she could walk from the bedroom to the kitchen. She's used one in physical therapy and it's helping, but she's more than $80,000 away from owning one. If she has that exoskeleton, it will be able to help her be able to move around even just short distances. Girls from all five schools sold dollar chocolate bars at school. Parents at work too, nearly 3,000 of them. We were able to raise a lot of money through that, but we were also able to talk about Anna and talk about how much we love her, we care about her, how she's an inspiration to us all. I am hopeful. I know that we're not financially there, but I do believe in miracles and yeah, absolutely. And I believe in prayers and everything I can get. It's in her blood. It's in her heart, it's in her soul, it's who she is. And you are forever a gymnast. Megan Dillard. <laughs> Fox 4 News. Now it can be stressful to go to court, especially for some younger people who have been traumatized. Now more courts around the country are letting witnesses use therapy dogs to help keep them calm. And a pilot therapy dog program, Kent County, Michigan, is off to a great start. Candace Charles reports. No <laughs> Dogs in the courtroom is not something you see every day, but it's an idea that has proven to help young victims all over the nation take the stand. Traditionally, that has been, oh my gosh, we're animals in the courtroom and who wants to do that? But I think that it has been done in other places and you're seeing the positive effects. Going to court can be stressful for anyone, but Kent County's Courthouse Therapy Dog Program's goal is to alleviate some of that stress, providing a welcoming distraction for young vulnerable witnesses. Our idea is twofold. One, the physiological results of that lowering the child's blood pressure, but also giving them something a little more to focus on so they're not just focusing on the bad things that happen. They can also be petting a dog and having a nicer 
experience doing that. Teaming up with West Michigan Therapy Dogs, the pilot program offers courthouse dogs that can help witnesses meet with prosecutors, wait to testify, and attend court. Judge Kathleen Feeney says the support will make a difference in future testimony. And calm, it helps them to focus, and in a criminal case that helps them to recall facts um, more easily and give more accurate testimony. And, and that's what we want. A recent bail allowing dogs in the courtroom pushed the program along. Now several other Michigan courts have implemented courthouse dog programs, and Feeney says she hopes to extend the program across Kent County to help as many young victims and vulnerable adults on the stand as they can. These child victims have already been traumatized significantly. And if we do something small like have a, a dog there that they can pet, just to kind of keep them calm or they can talk to the dog about what happened to them and it doesn't make coming to court more traumatizing for them, then that's fabulous. It is now time for another break. Coming up, coming up later in the show, we will take a look at a couple of robots helping local farmers. Beyond the District will be right back. Welcome back to Beyond the District. I'm Lauren Pickero. It's something out of a science no fiction novel, where robots in California are growing food in an indoor farm on their own. The high tech farm could be a step in feeding people around the world. Len Ramirez reports. Fine tune like our nutrients. Almost hidden away in a San Carlos warehouse, robots are growing and harvesting food. It's a potential revolution in agriculture happening under the lights and in near silence. You're at Iron Ox. This is the world's first production robotic farm. CEO Brandon Alexander was born and bred on old school family farms in Texas and Oklahoma, but his love for robotics pushed him to develop methods for machines to do the tedious jobs like seeding, transplanting, and harvesting. And he says robots could help solve a growing farm labor crisis. Our goal is to use technology like robotics and machine learning to be able to grow produce at better quality, more consistently, and cheaper. Several companies around the world are venturing into autonomous agriculture, but Iron Ox says its technology and methods set it apart. A robotic arm is outfitted with stereoscopic cameras that allow it to see in 3D and gently work around the tender leaves and stems of young plants. The plants are all contained in hydroponic pods, so they are grown in water, not soil, and that's where this comes in. You're riding aboard a machine that may be the John Deere of the future. They call it Angus, and it does all the heavy lifting. It rolls on special wheels that rotate forward and backward and side to side. Uh, we have beautiful, very fragrant basil, um, butterhead. The company is first focusing on salad greens, all grown in the warehouse, and it's packaging produce and testing with local chefs. Well, we're focusing on restaurants initially. We do expect to expand to, to grocery stores in 2019. Although California has easy access to the freshest greens, many parts of the world do not. Iron Ox says with its automated methods, it can produce a delicious salad bowl anywhere. 
in San Carlos, Len Ramirez, KPIX 5. Next, record snowfall. That's not something you want to hear in the first week of October. More than a foot of snow has buried Calgary and brought this Canadian city known for hosting the 1988 Winter Olympics to a standstill. Allison Dempster reports. Calgary is digging out, and there's a lot of digging to do. Environment Canada says the city got 33 centimetres of snow. That's the official number. But parts of the city are reporting 45 centimetres. The city has had to call on surrounding communities for help. A fleet of 30 snowplows from Edmonton arrived overnight. Crews and equipment have also come in from Red Deer and Medicine Hat. And they're dealing with a nasty combination of snow and ice. It's led to more than 300 accidents in Calgary alone. You don't drive to the speed limit on days like we've had today and yesterday. You drive to the road conditions. So give yourself some extra time, give yourself some extra dis distance and really slow down. A section of the Trans-Canada west of Calgary was shut down yesterday, leaving hundreds of motorists stranded in their vehicles. I was sitting for uh, 14 hours. Uh, yeah, it was kind of a real big. A lot of people were turning their vehicles off to uh, save fuel because they didn't think they'd have enough gas to make it to the night. A lot of them were really disappointed just because they were really kind of stuck there and um, we didn't really see any emergency vehicles or anything like that. The weather system that delivered this winter wallop has moved on, but not before breaking a snowfall record for an October day that was set 104 years ago. Allison Dempster, CBC News, Calgary. Now we check out how parents in one Nevada town were unhappy to learn their local elementary school was eliminating teacher positions. So they came together and collected enough money to pay one of their salaries. Orko Mana has a story. Really happy that we met the goal. Bonnie Mason has a daughter in first grade at Twitchell Elementary School. She's one of several parents who came together to raise $62,000 in just a matter of weeks, all in an effort to save staff positions. We all want to do what we can to help the school, and uh, I, everybody seemed to be pretty inspired to jump in, including myself. I donated. Three teaching jobs at Twitchell were on the chopping block due to lower than expected student enrollment this fall. The $62,000 raise will be a full salary package and allow one teacher to stay. Principal Michelle Woldridge spearheaded the fundraising campaign and is overwhelmed by the support. It wasn't easy. Um, people gave whatever they could give and we're just grateful for whatever we got. Every, every penny mattered in this case. What better cause to raise money than the greatest resource that we have as a teacher? The school is excited that they've saved one teaching position, but the harsh reality is that they'll still be losing two educators. They're amazing teachers and our, and our kids will be missing out. While CCSD is happy Twitchell will retain one teacher, it does not encourage fundraising as a way to do so. Our concern is that some schools do have the, the neighborhoods around them that can fundraise to save a teaching position, but many schools do not. And we don't want to create an inequity here. The two staff members who are leaving teach first and second grade, so those class sizes are going up. Already my daughter has said we have two new students in our class. But school officials say it's still a victory. They're not losing all three. We just couldn't stand by and let that happen. It was just too big of an impact. Orko Mana, 8 News Now. Wrapping up tonight's show, a pair of North Dakota brothers are enjoying a family of mice their mother let them bring home from their local Kmart Monday. But these mice didn't come from the pet section. They were found in a pair of winter boots. Kevin Walvand has a story. Helen and Deacon Reederer, along with their mom Shasta, were not sure what those little things were rolling out of the new winter boot. He goes, Mom, look. I honestly thought it was Vienna sausages laying on the floor until they started moving and we heard them squeaking. They were no Vienna sausages. They were a family of mice, not just two, seven, and the mother. And the boys pleaded with their mom they wanted to take them home. They're cute. I don't want to touch this one. Super grossed out, but they're kind of cute. Mom, they don't have diseases. Right here. You don't know that. They're so cute. Kmart and Bismarck didn't want the mice, so the boys and their mother got the mice home. Got them comfortable, just in time for feeding. Let the kids take them home. Got a little the fish tank ready for them. Kids put them in there, and they've been happy ever since. Now they'll be released into the wild. And the boy's mother, one proud mom. So proud of them that they have that kind of compassion that they are willing to save mice when it would have grossed everybody else out. Remember, if you have a story you would like to cover, or if you have an announcement about an upcoming event, please send an interschool mail to the TV studio at High School East, or you can email us at tv21 at trschools.com.
Also, be sure to tune in TV21 throughout the day to catch this show and Tom's River Schools today. As we bring you stories around the district, also please take a look at our website, www.trschools.com slash TV21. Well, that wraps up tonight's show. For Beyond the District, I'm Lauren Pecorero. And I'm Kira Bruno. Have a great night.